You used to be able to say to people, oh, you don't believe in evolution? Well, do you believe in the germ theory of disease? But now you can't say that because I go, no, I don't. <laughs> Investigate your faith because truth withstands scrutiny. So we shouldn't be afraid to scrutinize and, and look behind the curtain because if the Bible's true, no matter how much you investigate, it's gonna be vindicated by the investigation. You can study chemistry and geology and you can look at these ice cores and you can look at dendrochronology and trees and biology. And I always ask these people, what is a better tool than the scientific method for investigating the natural world? The pyramids themselves are in a necropolis. They're in a, a giant, they're surrounded by tombs. I don't know how my grandma made her famous apple pie, but I know it wasn't aliens. Hey everyone, welcome to the Deep Drinks Podcast. My name is Dave. This is uh, a podcast where the drinks are deep, the conversations are deeper. And today we have Thomas Westbrook, who you may know as Holy Kool-Aid. Uh, Thomas Westbrook is the creator of the popular channel Holy Kool-Aid, which boasts 235,000 subscribers and 26 million views, which is insane. Uh, Thomas is a former Christian, now atheist, who promotes scientific skepticism and free thought, uh, helping people build skills necessary to debunk pseudoscience and misinformation. In my opinion, uh, Thomas is one of the most genuine and down-to-earth content creators that are on the platform. Um, he has amazing locks, as you can see. Look at those beautiful locks. I love them. Um, and he speaks at conferences all over the world. Um, so I'm honored to welcome Thomas Westbrook to the Deep Drinks podcast. Welcome, Thomas. It's quite the introduction. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, uh, Thomas, um, I, I, I want to start this by saying that when we uh when i was talking to shannon q i mentioned the drink that you chose for uh the deep drinks podcast and she responded by saying of course he chose that um because it is it is a doozy so i would like normally i introduce what we're drinking but i'd like for you to explain what what are we drinking today well can i say the name of the drink on the show or am i allowed to swear yeah absolutely swear as much as you want so the the drink is called an audios motherfucker and <laughs> It's basically, it's like a Long Island iced tea in terms of its alcohol content, but you add a, a dollop of this blue stuff to it. And so by the time that, that we're done, we should be uh, thoroughly tipsy at the very least. And the reason, yeah. the reason that I, I chose this drink is because at the end of every single one of my episodes on my show, I always say, dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid. Like go out there and explore, but be careful because, you know, you don't want to be so open-minded that your brain falls out that you just go chasing at, off after every cult leader and crazy person that comes along. Now, because I say that at the end of every single one of my episodes, when I started hosting a conference called the Faithless Forum, we would bring content creators, various atheists and skeptic content creators together for a conference. And at the after party, we had custom drinks. And a lot of the custom drinks had names relevant to our channels. And mine was called the Kool-Aid. And what better drink to choose for the Kool-Aid than a bright blue drink that literally has a warning on it saying, do not drink this because it is so alcoholic that it will land you on your butt faster than you can say, don't drink the Kool-Aid. That is so awesome. I'm so glad I waited to hear that story. That's awesome. I uh, And we, we mentioned um, just before we started this that you have a show to go to after this and I have a family event to go to after this and we're both going to probably rock up um, quite jolly, uh, <laughs> also to say the least. Um, so we've both got these drinks in front of us. We've got to mix them because there's a lot involved, right? So um do you want to get do you want to do you want to give us a rundown how we mix in this drink you're the expert so the the first step is you're going to take about a, a half an ounce of vodka which okay. i believe a half an ounce is what about a shot so i don't know because in in australia we use the correct measurement system which mm -hmm. we don't use like ounces and stuff we use like kilograms and millimeters because we're you know we're Just normal part of the... <laughs> so, sorry i was trying to make a joke but you you didn't bite. You're supposed to bite. <laughs> um, so, so I don't know. So I've, I'm just going to go a shot for each. About 15 milliliters. Uh, yeah, but oh, I don't know how much yeah. is in a shot. So I'm just got. I'm just going to okay. pour a shot in so, for each one. I'm just going to mix it in the big cup and then see if it all fits into the uh, the normal size cup. Yeah. So half an ounce of vodka, and then delicious. Take 
a half an ounce of rum. And I, I'm not an expert on this, but I think you want to use white rum. At least that's what I've got. So, well, I've got this fancy ass rum that I got um, for another episode. So I don't know if it's white or not, but no, it's definitely not white. You can use other rums, but I think if you go with like a super spiced rum, it would maybe add a slightly different flavor than what yeah. most AMFs end up with. But that's okay because if it adds a little bit of fun spice, it already is kind of a citrusy drink. I'm sure it'll be all right. But I'm not where I'm not, I'm not. I don't think we're drinking this and going. Mm, the flavors are so complex, and um, I mean, this serves a very different purpose than the uh, the traditional cocktail, I guess. Exactly. And then um, after that, you get another shot of tequila. Oh yeah, I got this one, Altos something. I just got this uh, Camarena. Oh nice. Did you have all this on in stock, like just at, not in stock, but just at your house? Most of it. I didn't have any yeah. rum. But so um, I. I had picked up a bunch of this stuff before because I had some friends over and they wanted to do AMFs while they were here. Um, <laughs> simply because, you know, it's the it's Kool-Aid. It's a drink. Yeah, yeah, it's the Kool-Aid. Don't and, drink the Kool-Aid or do if it's delicious. All right. Let me not lose track of what all I've put in there. So now we're down to the gin. Yeah. So I've got boodles of gin over here. I've got the botanist um, who I drank with uh heathen queen i think i believe yeah i may have poured a couple of these shots too generously i'm starting to oh. this. <laughs> look at this look at this i'm gonna be sloppy so i need to apologize uh on behalf of the audience um i have to drink what the guest drinks i don't want to drink alcohol they just always seem to choose it uh so i'm gonna be quite sloppy by the end and then the next ingredient is this i've i i have heard it called both blue curacao and blue curacao but i think that when there's a c with a line through it that's a ch sound okay so, i've never sure heard of this before who's wrong and who's right because i'm not exactly an expert in oh my own drink God. i'm like, just looking at, like how much alcohol this is and i actually like i was kind of memeing before but i'm actually a little nervous now this is a lot this is gonna be right. fun and now you do Four times that with sweet and sour mix, but I, I don't think that right. the sweet and sour mix. Yeah, it's it's non alcoholic unless you yeah. got an alcoholic version. No, no, no. Really oh god, no. I'm just gonna pour case, mine in and just eye it. May God have mercy on your soul. All right. I'm gonna add, and then splash of sprite. Um, yeah, and then then what you do is you take the sprite and you fill it all the way to the top. I'm gonna put some ice in. Is that cool? Yeah, I, I added a little bit of ice in mine as well. Oh my gosh. And then, oh, Thomas, this looks like death warmed up. I can smell it. It's like stinging my eyeballs. Yeah, then um, you, you can use either Sprite or 7-Up. <laughs> oh, mine's a little shaken. Yes, yeah, so it's mine. Oh, the spirit's almost, moving. Almost got some on my keyboard. That would have not been good. Oh, that would have been a fun All interview. Right. So now you... This is the first time we've mixed drinks on the podcast and i tell you what this is fun um, it is fun it's it's more complicated than just pouring a shot of whiskey you might be you might be setting a whole new tone for the for the podcast um so then you take a cherry which i should have grabbed a fork but i guess a, a knife i don't actually it. have any of the garnishes unfortunately yeah the garnishes are optional um you can choose you can also add a lemon wedge i picked up a lime but i can't find my lime so i actually just <laughs> have a cherry have you had any have you had any drinks so far because you, you're forgetting <laughs> i can't find the lime um yeah i mean i guess i'm after off to a bad start if i uh, <laughs> aren't misplacing things but or a good start i mean yeah. but right, I, so I already look at this thing misplaced stuff all the time anyways all right, so I'm just going to pour mine in and try not to spill it everywhere. <laughs> now, the thing is, because mine's in a big cup, a lot of this is Sprite. But there's still like five shots or something in here. So I yeah. have to go through both of these. But it's it's not like I'm drinking more alcohol than you by drinking two. Yeah. Well, look at this 
look how the color of mine. I don't know what happened to yours. Mine's definitely more blue. Yours Unless is darker pretty... because the you used a uh, a darker color rum. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, the, and you, maybe is know. your lift yours up. I think your green screen might be. Oh. Yeah, you're green. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it that's looks funny. Like water. Although yeah. you can't see me behind it, so it's yeah. Weird. Now we're breaking the immersion. Everyone thought you were in this big library. This is oh no. <laughs> oh, I'm too poor so... for that many books. <laughs> oh, how, how good would it be though? That's like my dream to be rich enough to own a library of books that I'll never get around to reading. Um, <laughs> Uh, so this is actually a really good way to start because you grew up religious, like really religious, right? And you probably had never drank alcohol until you were uh, Well, oh. not, not exactly because, so I did grow up very religious, but I also grew up overseas. I was a missionary kid. And in the U.S., there, there tends to be a very strong kind of strict no alcohol if you're underage type of thing. Overseas, hmm. it's not as big of an issue. And my parents weren't quite as strict. Like they were strict about a lot of stuff. They were super strict about anything sexual. They, you know, were strict when it came to language, what movies and shows I watched. And they didn't like me drinking alcohol. So like I, I kind of didn't normally tell them, but it wasn't this end of the world. Like I remember after I had my, I had my first beer, I think when I was 15 and I, I bragged to my mom about it. <laughs> and he was, she was kind of noticeably upset, but because it was over at one of my friend's house while his parents were there and like it was supervised, she didn't really throw too much of a fit. And yeah. then whenever I would go out with friends and stuff, we would, you know, we'd get a couple beers and play some pool. It was in that area. It was a lot less strict than you would expect. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. That's really, that's really interesting. So um, can you like give us a bit of a, a backstory on like your Christian or your your brought up Christian? Did you have a born again experience? Did you what type of Christianity were you involved in? Um, yeah, so my my parents were missionaries, like I said, and the the organization that they were with is it's called YWAM, and it's hmm. considered as a like, I know I know YWAM. It's like a non denominational or multi denominational. But at the same time, it got started kind of in Assemblies of God. It's very evangelical. They believe in faith healing. They believe in, you know, demons and, and angels and spirits and stuff. They pretty much everything in the Bible is is taken pretty literally. I think you may have some, some people who are not young earth creationists that are a part of the organization, but most of them are fairly fundamentalist. And that was mm. my upbringing. So I, from the time I was about three years old, I was a missionary kid overseas and I had a, you know, I was dedicated to God as a baby. I was baptized when I was seven years old. I, you know, threw myself into the church, had devotions every morning, quiet time on my own every morning, read the Bible constantly, memorized huge sections of it, went to church every Sunday, youth group, everything. And then in addition to that, when I was, when I got older and I graduated from from uh, high school, I worked at a church camp as a church camp counselor. I worked at a church as a youth pastor and a um, worship leader briefly just for a summer. But I also was a missionary in Kazakhstan for one semester. I was wow. a part of the Christian fraternity. I really pretty much anything that you could do in ministry. I threw myself wholeheartedly into it, very much believed it, very much um, thought it was true, was completely dedicated to God. And so whenever people, you know, come out, people who don't know me, who have these accusations that say, Oh, you were never a true Christian or else you wouldn't be. Yeah. An now I'm like, it, sadly, it doesn't work like that. People can yeah. change their minds over time as they're presented with new evidence and realize that, Hey, there's better explanations for this stuff. And I think I was wrong, you know? Yeah. Uh, did you have like a born again experience? Yeah. I multiple uh, there, like there were multiple times when I, you know, I did the altar call and I, you know, I prayed the prayer and, you know, got, you know, confirmed and, and uh, in my faith, there were numerous times when I felt like I was experiencing the Holy Spirit. I got the the chills, the goosebumps, the excitement, you know, we called it being drunk on the spirit because you kind of just yeah. almost go into sort of like a trance. For me, it wasn't like jumping around like these crazy uh 
Pentecostal dances so much, but like I would, there were multiple times when I was just like sobbing and like hands in the air, just, you know, praying and, and feeling like I was, I was caught up in, in that, that energy. Yeah. And in retrospect, now, when I look back on it, it's, it's an experience that I've seen replicated in multiple other religions. And I've even oh. seen people in these, you know, crazy concerts where they're just so ecstatic, just going nuts because there's Justin Bieber or there's Michael Jackson. Mm. And they're just almost having this surreal spiritual experience, but there's nothing spiritual or supernatural yeah. about it. And so because of that, when, when I had those experiences earlier and then as I got older, I realized, Hey, there's, these are literally just chemical phenomena that are going on in the brain. It mm. became very hard for me to claim that that was something supernatural. It was the same experience everyone else around me was experiencing. At least the way that they described it was the same. I, I can't put myself inside their brain, but from everything else that I was hearing, I was going through the same thing they were. Hmm. It's, it, it is interesting. I just released a video. I was uh, interviewed uh, by Michael Granado um, the other day and he asked me like, how do I reconcile these spiritual experiences I have with now no longer being a believer? And my, my thoughts were exactly like yours is that, that there are other religions that have these same claims, these same experiences. Um, or my wife, when she would go to musicals, she'd have these same feelings that she'd get in church. Um, so I don't deny that I had those experiences. I just don't attach a truth claim to them. I don't say, therefore, God is real and Adam and Eve were real and all that. I just say, okay, I had these experiences. I, I, may, I may not be able to um, explain it. I think it's probably mostly psychological, some form of, couldn't be some form of hypnosis for the really insane moments, but, um, or some sort of an illusion, I guess. But I, I don't know. But uh, yeah, it, it doesn't seem to, it, it would be hard for different religions to all point to the same um like to all all have certain experiences and then you know they're all mutually exclusive you know what i mean yeah and and you know if if you want to kind of look into the the psychology behind it and the neuroscience behind it we know that these type of experiences that are setting you up for this big thing this anticipation there's there's you you get this spike of dopamine so you feel you know euphoric you feel great in the moment mm. At the same time, you're you're stressed because they're calling you forward. You're standing up in front of people. You're walking forward in the, that altar call, and so you know you've got this tremendous amount of um, like adrenaline, adrenaline, in your veins, and serotonin and um, glucocorticoids and stuff. So like all of these chemicals are like the the stress aspect of it. But then people lay hands on you, and you're getting the physical touch, and you've got the oxytocin flowing through you. You just get this sense of like this flood of relief. And a lot of times these chemicals can act as painkillers too. So if they're praying over you for some type of pain that you have, some chronic pain or something in your body, you know, you're getting that flood of relief from that. And sometimes you've got the, the placebo effect as well. If there's certain conditions that maybe have a psychosomatic element to them, then you may get, you know, some relief that's, you know, longer term than just a, an immediate mm. sensation. And so, so you kind of couple all of that together and you're, you're in a situation where the music is amped up, all these other people are in on it. You know, you don't want to disappoint. You don't want to let others down. You really, really want it to be true. You feel like you've, you've been propped up as this horrible, filthy sinner. And now here's your chance to be clean and to, to just lay it all down and you're forgiven. And it's just this flood of emotions and just like, I don't deserve this. I'm unworthy. You have all of this stacked up and it's this perfect cocktail for this kind of experience. Uh, Emil Durkheim refers to it as collective effervescence, where you're in this group state of, you know, whether you're moving all together, swaying together, raising your hands together, clapping, you know, doing some, some of the songs we would do had hand motions and stuff. Sometimes people would dance. You look at the, the Sufi Muslims, they'll be running around in a circle together. So you're getting kind of this dizzy high in addition to all of this. And you, you add all of that together. And now you're in this perfect situation to where, where you're susceptible for, you know, any kind of influence that someone has on you where they, you know, this, this, especially if you have like a pastor who's he's seen as the authority figure and he's the one who's here to, you know, lay his hands on you and heal you and, and cure you and forgive your sins and all this stuff. And all of a sudden you are now 
you're now vulnerable to that. You're open to it, but you're also, you feel like there's something more than just the physical. Because in our day to day, when we're just sitting around the, the house watching TV, we don't usually have the, this you know, mm. cocktail of emotions and chemicals exploding in our brains. That that is that has to be the most succinct explanation of this spiritual kind of stuff that I've ever heard. That is profound because that all makes sense, right? There's like this this group mentality. This it's all it's all kind of happening. The 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 flood of uh, dopamine that you know uh, removes pain. A friend of mine, um, yeah, he broke his neck and he was in a cast. And in a prayer meeting, they cut off his um, his cast. Um, with his broken neck and then dug their knuckles into his broken neck to prove that it was healed because he's like i can't feel anything and then digging it in and digging it in and you know he couldn't move his head before that and um he was healed like he had no issues for three days until he was rushed to emergency again because his neck <laughs> something happened to his neck and um you know and then it was a big puzzle why did this happen why you know what did he have sin did he think of a woman lustfully did he I'm, I'm not this wasn't spoken about but this is what people are probably thinking you know why, why did it come back is this the devil's work you know whereas in actuality it probably wasn't healed at all he probably mm. had you know the this the pain relief from like i was saying this this neurological cocktail and then at the same time if he's had this restrictive cast on you know kind of cutting off the the blood circulation and the blood flow just a little bit on like the keeping it stable the skin and all of a sudden they take that off and he's kind of getting a little bit of like tingling sensation back but the pain is still kind of you know maybe mm. a little bit of relief from yeah not having it so constricted but he doesn't have the support and his neck is still broken and now you've yeah. got digging into a person with a broken neck and rather than being like hey let's be cautious with this let's <laughs> let's go get an x-ray and see if the neck is actually healed instead they're just like oh we if we did that then that wouldn't be faith and we we have to believe on faith. Uh, yeah i just love like you're you you're on the other side of the world you're in northern hemisphere on the southern hemisphere and we just we both have the same we know the thought process of the so of, of like these people like the, the same experience yeah. um how how did so like do, were you you know you you went through spiritual experiences and, and 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 things like that how did you start to question your faith it was definitely a long process i didn't just go one day from hey i believe all of it and then there's one little seed of doubt and i was out it, it was a gradual slow journey i think that some of the early seeds that i can remember at least <clears throat> were when i was in high school maybe 16 17 my youth pastor, who was a fairly liberal youth pastor compared to what I was used to, he was an old earth creationist and he believed in evolution. And I remember him telling me that when you go off to college and you learn all of this stuff and you realize that, hey, there actually is a lot of evidence for evolution in an old earth, you don't have to throw out your faith. You don't have to throw out religion. It's okay to believe that you know, the first few chapters of Genesis are metaphorical and that God used evolution as a process to get us here. And so initially I was like, oh, that didn't quite sound right to me, but I was, I became more open to parts of the Bible not being literally true and mm -hmm. parts of it being, you know, metaphorical. And when I went off to college, sure enough, after a little bit of time, I started kind of looking into it and taking some science classes and watching TED talks and reading books and realized that this actually is the way that the world works. This is the way that we got here. Evolution is happening. It's been happening for billions of years. And because of that, you know, I kind of started kind of shifting away from this literalist interpretation. And I also, I had a friend, I remember who, when I was a church camp counselor, he told me that it's, it's okay to investigate your faith because truth withstands scrutiny. So we shouldn't be afraid to scrutinize and, and look behind the curtain because if the Bible's true, no matter how much you investigate, it's going to be vindicated by the investigation. And the mm. truth will always will always still shine out as the truth. And so I was I was open to exploring. And the more that I explored, the more that I realized that there was not a lot of truth to this stuff. Like there were elements, there were bits and pieces of 
history you know there were bits and pieces of truth kind of sprinkled throughout and that's kind of what i've been exploring more lately is is now the historical side of it and you know looking at the archaeological findings and stuff to see how much of the bible is actually history and how much of it is myth and how much of it is legend and there's you know any historian will tell you that it's difficult to come up with definitive answers for any of that but the further back you go in time the less historical it becomes yeah, in interesting. Do you do you find like on a side note, do you find that now that you don't have, I guess, I'll say the burden of faith, the burden of religiosity, I guess, mm -hmm. even though I think religion can do some good things. Do you find that investigating the hist historicity of the Bible and and the other religions is more interesting? Oh, way more interesting. In fact, uh, investigating everything I feel is way more interesting. There, there's a passage in the Book of Job where basically for for your viewers who the the odd viewer who doesn't know the story of job basically it's this guy who in the bible god decided to test him or allowed the devil to test him and he lost all of his family he lost all of his wealth all of his flocks and he's basically sitting there covered in all of these boils and all of his friends are mocking him saying you must have ticked god off and done something awful and job's like no i've i've been righteously following him and i continue to to follow god and and even though people are saying curse God and die, he's, he doesn't do it. He, he stays faithful to the end. And then when God shows up and gives him all of his wealth back and gives him a new family and all this stuff, then Job's like, why'd this happen? And God's like, how dare you question me? Like, were you there when the foundations of the earth were laying? Have you seen the, you know, the marvels of, you know, the, the stars and all of this stuff? And the description of it is very, very Iron Age and limited in its imagination. And as soon as you start to realize how the universe actually works, you, you start to realize that we have probed the depths of the oceans and we have, you know, put a probe on a comet and landed on the moon and, it, you know, looked out into outer space and, and measured exactly what various stars and supernovae are made of. And the, the lack of imagination in scripture it's so limited in comparison to what science has opened up for us to mm. explore and, and discover and find out and realize that, holy crap, we literally are made of stardust because these, these stars, these planets that we're observing that are coming together, all it takes to form a star is like matter, inter or matter gravity, and time. That's it. And you've got these dust clouds of like hydrogen and the most basic possible simplest elements that over time they come together and all that gravity cr creates the, a larger and larger mass and that adds up pressure and the pressure makes heat. And then before you know it, you have enough that they ignite into these gigantic balls that have nuclear fusion going on and they're, they're forming harder and you know heavier and heavier elements. And these heavy elements, when the stars eventually collapse and explode outwards, those are the elements that are found in me and you and everyone else. And we it, can observe it's, this. It's so beautiful. Hey, it's 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 amazing. Like to think that I remember when I first um, started looking into evolution, I was just so amazed at the fact that life, like we could look back in the in, you know in the um, geologic column and we could see life progress through. And I was just like, I looked at you know my um, dog at the time who had his um, who had his uh. uh He's, uh, he was dissexed. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, you're the end of the line. Like 3.4 billion years of evolution. You've gone through like so much. Your your gene pool has been, and you're just dead. You just stop. Or like, I'll, I'll look at him because he was a bit useless. And I go, this is what 3.4 year, billion years of evolution has come up to you. Your, your, your snotty nose, your, you know, you got you know floppy ears. Like, yeah, yeah. And it was just amazing. Like I got such, such an appreciation for, uh you know life and the planet and the environment and space it's just it's incredible um especially especially when you you know you when you put in perspective of like i you know i used to think the earth was six thousand years old and you know adam and eve were real and, and things like that so it's just such a more exciting thing i would agree with you so much there well and here's where it gets crazy is you can explore more than just one field. So mm. for me, one of the most exciting things with this whole process is back when I was religious, it was like, okay, this book 
this is the truth. And then there's these evil scientists out there that are trying to deceive you and trying to plant seeds of doubt. And they're in league with the devil or whatever else, whatever other reason. They just want to live a life of sin. So they keep promoting this, this nonsense. And yet when I got out of it, or even while I was still in it and I started exploring and looking, I started to realize that it's not just this overarching idea of like the scientists. You have people studying ice cores in Antarctica that are digging down miles deep. And they know that in these areas that have permafrost, that there's that the the ice is laid down every single year. And it, it's not they don't look by how deep it is, but they can go back and see how many years the ice has been laid down. And the way that they measure this is they take these these ice cores that they drill out and they place them on a um on a, a little melting plate. And as the, the ice melts, they're using spectrographic analysis to see exactly, exactly what the chemical composition is. And so it like melts and you see as it's melting, if, if you look at, you know, time on the, the X axis, you're seeing certain chemical fluctuations going up and down at a steady rate. So, and basically what, what it's indicating is that as the seasons pass, as you go from you know the the spring to the summer to the winter to the fall, then you have in the air in the snow these chemicals. You'll see certain spikes and dips throughout the season. So you might see a certain higher amount of one chemical abundance in the summer, and then it might drop in the winter. And it's a very consistent, consistent uh, way that it goes through that. And so basically, they can take these ice cores and they can melt them on these these sheets, these these melting plates, and measure that and see back tens of thousands of years just using this mm. and it, it's incredible because then there's this there's overlap with so many other fields because they can they can measure a bunch of different things they can see how much carbon was in the atmosphere at you know ten thousand years ago or five thousand years ago and they can use these measurements to help better calibrate our other instruments for say carbon 14 dating or they can can look at tree rings and look at you know if they, they lay down, you know, certain trees will uh, create one ring every single year. Yeah. And, and then other, other trees, uh, or th then they can, can look at those trees and see if this tree is, you know, 500 years old, they look at that and they look at another tree that maybe was cut down 500 years ago or, or 250 years ago that has some overlap and they see exactly based off of how thin and thick they are, they can go back and the scientists have done this with forests, fossilized forests, on top of fossilized forests that like go back tens of thousands of years where there's, you know, a volcanic eruption that would bury it in ash and they'd get, you know, all the trees would uh, die. Hmm. And then there'd be another forest that would rise on top of that one. And then it would happen again. And so like, you can go way further back and this isn't even using radiometric dating or carbon dating or um, th there's various forms of radiometric dating, like um, uh, uranium lead and potassium argon and others. And yet every single one of these methods they can use to date things. Uh, thermoluminescence is another one for dating pottery. And they're all very different ways of dating things, but you can can take objects that you know how old they are. And, you know, if like, let's say that there's a, an object that has historical writing and it's tied to a specific person, you, you know that when that person lived, because there's, you know, we have a written record all the way back that's uh, mm. unbroken. And you can use these measurements and measure it and you get a measurement that falls within that window. And then you go back further and it's it's these consistent rates and you can keep going further and further and further back. And so for the mm. young creationists to just come along and be like, nope, it's just the Bible says, the Bible told me so. <laughs> and there's no evidence. Whereas with science, the fact that you can like, you can study chemistry and geology and you can look at these ice cores and you can look at dendrochronology and trees and biology. You can look at the rate at which mutations happen and you can mm. go back and take a, a sample, a DNA sample from, you know, a, an early human that was frozen in ice 50,000 years ago and analyze the DNA. And you see that the, the amount that they are uh, distantly related to us, basically, you know, you, you can do like a, uh, carbon 14 dating on that that uh, uh, person, that frozen corpse. And then you can also look at the DNA and see the rate, the, the difference in the mutation from them to us. And it perfectly adds up with the rate of mutation. And yeah. so, you know, Christians will come along and try to say, well, how do you know that the rate is constant? And it's like, okay, well, 
if let's say that uh the person was they they were mutating at a much higher rate well then you get this little thing called cancer and you die <laughs> like <laughs> you know or, or if, if the rate of let's say of carbon 14 um the 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 isotope basically degrading into uh carbon 12 if that rate were astronomically higher to to where the earth was 6000 years old then if if it was going through that kind of a rapid rapid um change it would it would be so hot that it would be like the the entire earth would basically be like nu in this like nuclear eruption yeah, yeah. so you really like they they try to pick and choose like the the you know the, they'll try to discount carbon 14 entirely and they'll try to you know discount other yeah. stuff but they 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 do it all you know kind of one at a time shooting things down but yeah what yeah you have to realize is there's this mountain this absolute gigantic mountain of like mm. hundreds of different fields and they're all overlapping and they're yeah. all they're, if it's a venn diagram there's like this circle of stuff that they all agree on and they all confirm and nothing has 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 uh disproven this and that's mm. the, the theory of evolution by natural selection it's one of yeah. the most attested two theories and they're like oh it's just a theory and they, they don't understand what theory is <laughs> yeah theory. i know i know that always yeah. that always that like, drives me nuts do you what's what's what i what i always what i think is the golden standard and then i'm not a scientist um but i love science but what i what i always love is that when we build these models of reality we can produce novel testable predictions so for example we're like okay the theory of evolution says X, Y, Z. That means that we should see A, B, C at this location. They go there, they dig up Tiktaalik. Like, it's just mm -hmm. for that to be, for that to like be a coincidence would be mind boggling or the cosmic microwave background radiation. Okay, this is what the Big Bang says. This is what the math says. And then, you know, I think it was like 15 or 30 or 50 years later. It was a long time later. Um, some scientists were like, hey, our instruments are picking up something. You know, they spent a long time researching it. They find it's picking up this background radiation. They map it to the, the math for what should be the cosmic microwave background radiation. And it's exactly like it's like point for point, perfect mm. representation of what well, they're analyzing. And when it's when when they're off, when it's wrong, they go back to the drawing board and they refine mm. their 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 um, calculations. Yeah. And they come up with a new hypothesis and they test mm. it. And it, if it has predictive capabilities and it's falsifiable and they test it and test it and test it, they're like, hey, this is fitting all the data. This is pretty good. So, you the, know, there, the there's, thing... times, there's times when, you know, they might get something wrong or they might be inaccurate. Or oh, something, of course. It's always science that makes it more accurate. It's not, mm. oh, I had a revelation and I prayed about it. And all of a sudden now... You know, God told me to completely overthrow everything that we know about gravity. It's no, the the theory that we had, you know, with the Newtonian mechanics was pretty good, but it wasn't quite accurate enough because once you get out to like the 10th or 20th decimal or whatever, and you're looking at gigantic objects in, in outer space, all of a sudden it's not, it's not quite accounting for Mercury's orbit or something. Mm. And so, so there's like these little things where, you know, they'll, they'll come in and they'll, you know, uh, make a, a a change that explains it better more precisely mm. more accurately and so it's it's not yeah. like all of a sudden if i were to throw a ball up in the air and it lands back down it's not like all, oh no scientists were wrong gravity actually causes the ball to to float up and it's you know mm. there's no such thing as gravity it's like no newtonian mechanics is still incredibly useful and incredibly accurate it's just not quite as accurate because it's not the best that we have anymore we've gotten better yeah uh, th that's the thing too is like a lot of people will when i'm talking to a lot of people i say well science isn't isn't always right or science gets things wrong and i always just respond with like like that same argument with democracy democracy is the worst form of government besides all the others <laughs> well it's like sci science is like it's science isn't perfect but can you think of science isn't like this spiritual like god force that just tells you what's right and wrong it's a the scientific method is a tool and i always ask these people what is a better tool than the scientific method for investigating the natural world? The best answer I've ever had um, was believing that Jesus was the son of God. And I said, sorry. I said, how does that teach us about atoms? And they said, I don't want to have this conversation anymore. <laughs> I was like, okay, Jesus, great. Jesus who told people that they don't have to wash their hands because it's not what enters their mouth that makes them unclean, but what comes oh, yeah. out of their mouth. Yeah. Hey man, well, in, you know what's hot in the in the uh, conspiracy theory world these days is the germ theory of disease is not real. You know, 
So that's another one of the hot topics. <laughs> yeah. I don't you used to, to be able you used to be able to say to people, Oh, you don't believe in evolution? Well, do you believe in the germ theory of disease? But now you can't say that because I go, No, I don't. <laughs> and it's the same thing, you know, with when you say, Oh yeah, well, what about the theory of gravity? And it's like so obviously something that has been, you know, this we know that gravity exists. We've measured mm -hmm. gravitational waves at LIGO. Like, yeah, we we know that this is a thing. We can predict exactly, exactly, exactly the orbits of you know all the planets to the point where if you go back five thousand years, ten thousand years, you can calculate exactly where they are in the sky, and you can do the same thing moving forward. It's because we understand gravity that we can do that. And yet, you have flat earthers that are coming out and saying, "Well, gravity isn't real. It's just uh, it's it's like <laughs> density and buoyancy or something like that." Yeah, it's just it's utter my, nonsense. My, and... my favorite thing is when they say, um, uh, water always finds its level. I'm like, no, it doesn't. Like, no, it doesn't. What are you talking? No, it doesn't. Like, for, for one, what do you think water bubble water droplets are? Are they flat? No, they're, they're round. Oh, oh well, that's just a small amount. Okay, what are waves then? Well, that's just wave. Okay, what are tides then? Like, <laughs> it's like water finds its level. Like, it sounds like a good argument, but when you really are, when you ask them to explain what any of these other phenomena are, they just they just it just collapses upon itself like and and on top of that it's it's like okay what about what what about the you know if, if you look at if i take this this cup and i fill it all the way to the top and it's the water's kind of sticking up a little bit over the edge because you've got surface tension you know they're like yeah. oh that's just that's just a little bit okay well what about what about when you instead of just having you know the 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 uh, mo molecular bonds that are kind of holding holding each other together what if instead you increase that by you know, this massive amount, like, let's say that you have a force that's a lot, a lot, lot, lot more powerful, this huge object. And then they're all kind of held to it and sticking to it, like almost like gravity, but it's like, it's like a round object. It's like a globe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's, not, it's not just a couple of, of molecules that are, are held together by, you know, molecular bonds, but in, instead it's, it's actually, you know, a, a, a larger object with, you know, a really strong force that's, you know, yeah, all together. <laughs> my my favorite thing, I have um some friends who are flat earthers. Um, and I asked, I've asked them before. I've literally asked them before, like, oh, like, I, I don't want to be confrontational to them. They're quite religious, and I go, oh, uh, you're a flat earther. And they go, yeah, and I go, can why? Can you tell me why? Oh, I can't remember. I'm like, what? You can't remember why you're a flat? Like, why you think the Earth is flat? No, but I, I but I know it's flat. Can you give me a reason? Like, no, I don't know if I'll convince you. Like, but I'm not, I'm just asking for why you think the earth is flat. I, I can't remember, but the documentary show, there's like a coin thing you could do with your eyes and perspective. And I'm like, but wait. And, and I said, to him, I'm like, I'm like, I'm not trying to like debunk you or anything. I'm just, I'm interested. Like, if the earth's flat, I want to know about it. Like, I want to <laughs> tell me the secret. And they believed it despite being able to even explain why it was why they it is why they thought that like it was it was nuts like yeah it was, uh, some it was... some smart sounding person on youtube said it and you know a lot of times i'll see flat earthers that will respond similarly where they'll say oh you're you just believe that because you know the the mainstream media told you the schools told you the the scientists told you and i would say well okay then go out and test it, like measure it, learn, learn some physics, like actually learn how to do these experiments, learn how to measure this stuff and then go out and do it. And you'll find that the earth very much is not flat. Mm. The thing is that they, they don't, they don't understand that there are millions and millions of people on earth who aren't just taking you know the the media and the, the government at their word like there's people who go to universities and actually learn how to use these tools and how to measure this stuff and how to test it and how to try to debunk it and especially once you get into the, the higher levels not just the the undergraduate but once you start getting into to graduate degrees and, and phds you start learning how to explore and test and debunk and try to falsify long-standing existing beliefs and you're encouraged to do that and you're encouraged to go out and, and try and test and, and see stuff. And if for some reason you come up with some experiment that flips everything that we know on its head and you're able to replicate it and show your work, you win a Nobel Prize. Mm. And yeah, so great. It's, it's sad to me when people just say, oh, well, I don't I don't know why this works, but it's just it's just true because I, I heard someone say it.
I think that um, our, what I've noticed, capacity? where's where's our desire to to know? Mm, what I've noticed is, and, and this is going to be insulting to to conspiracy theorists, but what I've noticed is, and I used to I used to be a nine eleven truther at one stage, mm -hmm. vaguely, you know, like I used to I watched Zeitgeist and I was born into it when I was a teenager. But I used to believe like, aliens. Yeah, 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 all, all that kind of stuff, right? So, like, um, but the thing is, what I've noticed is, um, is this. And, I, and I'm applying this to myself back then as well, is it's lazy. It's intellectually lazy to usually to be a conspiracy theorist. They're not interested in reading papers unless they can just read the headline and move on. Um, they're not interested in looking into the data. They're, not, they're probably not going to read books on it. Usually, most people, they're interested because it's a cool documentary. It's a cool Facebook post. It's a cool, um, it's, it's, they, they feel on the in group. They, they love the dramatic music and stuff. And I just, yeah. I, it's, it's sad to me that, that, you know, if you, many times I've, I've said, Oh, like, you know, a friend of mine said, um, I, I work for a surveying and town planning company. We, we do surveying and we literally have to put in mathematical formulas into our data recorders to put 2d plans on a spherical earth because obviously over distances the millimeters matter and you know he, he was saying to me well the alien um the aliens had to build the had to have built the pyramids because the pyramids are so accurate that no modern technology today can replicate how accurate they are and i was like and i said hang on and i, I looked it up and i was like how many you know how accurate how square is the pyramid because that's what he was saying and um and I was like, we have instruments that record a, a height distance of 0 0.1 millimeters, right? So quite a, quite a small amount. And that's just basic stuff. That's not like even the high tech yeah. stuff. Um, and these pyramids were like 400 seconds out or something. It was like a, a huge, like 400 seconds out. We can't be three seconds out on most construction sites for shopping centers. Like you're telling what me- What do you mean when you say seconds out? So um, in the in surveying, you've got degrees, minutes, seconds. So you've got 360 degrees, and then between a degree, um, uh, um, uh, between each degree is, is 60 minutes, so mm -hmm. more angles, and then between each degree is 60 seconds. Okay. So so like say if you've got a point here um, and you're measuring to a point over here, mm -hmm. that angle between your point and the, the backstop, mm -hmm. what they call it, um, is um is, is measured in seconds right degrees minutes seconds yeah, yeah. so if you're shooting if you're shooting like a really long backside here you've got like a really long trig line here and then you're shooting a small distance here that's okay because even one or two seconds out means that i think one second over 200 meters is two millimeters yeah. so but if you're like five six the seven seconds distance, out, the yeah more. if this distance gets like yeah. way out then all of a sudden like you're, you're you know a small a few seconds out can be meters and of, of, yeah. of difference and when you're and talking so about the pyramids screw holes. when they, they have these massive objects and they're trying to make mm. them at right angles you're saying instead of being a perfect 90 degree yeah it's it's off by i think it's off by 400 seconds when i looked it up or, or it's a, it's it's a large amount or it might be 200 seconds but it's it's far more than than yeah. anything that would accept and, it on the most basic dog shit um construction and yet, site meanwhile we have, we have precision lasers that can, yeah. can perfectly cut you know and 3d print stuff precisely yeah. and at yeah. the same time we can go in and make you know computer processing chips that have you know however many mm. billions of little transistors and stuff in this yeah. tiny little space and i think i think yeah. where where his thoughts would have come from is the, the the documentary that he probably watched on like discovery channel or something about how ancient aliens built the pyramids was was probably something along the lines of we don't know how they did it back then. We don't know how they had the technology back then. And then, so that's probably, and then he's like, we don't have the technology today. This is how the thinking kind of, you know. So anyway, I'm, I digress. We've the, the thing is too, like I could, I, whenever someone says we don't know how they did it, therefore they couldn't have done it. I'm like, okay, well, aliens. I, I don't know how my grandma made her famous apple pie, but I know it wasn't aliens. <laughs> I know that my grandma made the apple pie. I saw her put it in the oven. I've, I've seen her take her recipe book out, even if I haven't read it. And I've seen mm. her come back from the store with apples and start cutting them. So it's, yeah. it's, it's like that with the pyramids. We have a tremendous amount of, we have their quarries where they dug the rocks. We have written records. Do we really? Records. Yes. I didn't know that. Okay. We have their, their grave sites, the, the literal, like the pyramids themselves are in a necropolis. They're in a, a giant 
they're surrounded by tombs. So when people say like, oh, well, they couldn't, you know, there's no way they were, you know, meant to bury the pharaohs and these things. It's like, it's literally in a graveyard. The quarries are right there next to it. We have their sleds that they hauled them on. We have depictions of them hauling these blocks on sleds. We have like the, the homes of the workers. We have the tools of the workers. We have all of this stuff. We know that the Egyptians built the pyramids. We oh, have, do we you have mean the 2 million the Israelite Israelites who <laughs> who somehow never have shown up in the archaeological <laughs> yeah exactly um so Thomas I want to keep this um on on topic but I do have this uh or not on topic but on time and I've started to feel the booze hit me so I thought this is a perfect time hopefully you're also feeling it to do what I like to call drink faster <laughs> what I like to call um I did this only once before with Shannon Q and you have both been on a little talk shows. You were on talk heathen. I'm not sure if you've been on the atheist experience, um, but you, you get a lot of call-ins, I've been mm. on a lot of call-in shows and it's called atheism destroyed checkmate atheists. And I'm going to, I've got 13 questions um, and I'm going to see if you can get through all 13 of them in the, in, in under three minutes. So that this is the game. Okay. Okay. So I'm they're, they're typical Just questions like, fire. Rapid fire. So there are typical questions like, you know, uh, that you hear all the time, like, um, if they're a monkey, uh, if we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? And mm -hmm. you'll be graded, and I'll let the audience decide, against Shannon Q. She got it done in two minutes and 28 seconds. Um, and you'll be graded on the quality of your answers and the speed at which can you beat her speed, okay? Can I just respond with God? You can respond. <laughs> you can respond. <laughs> you can respond however you like, okay? So... These are 13 questions. Uh, are, you, are you ready? Are you, are you down for this uh, game? Oh, the, the alcohol's hitting me, but I'm, let, let's, let's, let's give it a let's shot. It. Okay, so I'm going to start the timer now. You say you don't believe in God. How do you explain sunsets? I mean, the sun <laughs> goes around the earth, and once, if we're right here and it's over here, then it's blocked from view. Where do you get your morals from? We devise them. We talk to other people. We see what harms society and what benefits society. And we're able to improve them over time rather than being stuck in the Iron Age. <laughs> Why do you hate God? I don't. <laughs> um, don't seashells on the top of mountains prove Noah's Ark? No, they prove no. that when you have tectonic plates and one of them is like pushing down into the other one as they're shifting around and it causes a mountain range to to push up than if it was previously submerged, then you'll end up with seashells. Awesome. What about, um, what about the second law of thermodynamics? I mean, the, the second law of thermodynamics, what about it? That it, oh, it, wait, wait, wait. it just proves evolution and abiogenesis? No, okay. because, because, because on the whole, our, our system's not a closed system. Thermo, the second law of thermodynamics only applies to a closed system. We've got the, the energy from the sun, if you go back to the the origin of the universe and you look back, it was in a less entropic state. It's in a more entropic state now. But um, whether or not it, the, the second law of thermodynamics also says that it tends to decrease. It doesn't say that it's a hard and fast always will. And we don't know if it applies outside of this universe. Oh, wow. If we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? Um, well, why are there still, you know, what, if, if, if we came from dirt, why is there still dirt? If we came from, you know, if, if Americans came from British people, why are there still British people? Technically, humans are still apes. We're still a part of the, the same clade. But modern day monkeys and humans share a common ancestor. We didn't come from modern monkeys. We came from a common ancestor. What if you're wrong? Then I'll change my mind if I get better information. You just have to have faith. It's not really a question from a statement. Uh, I, I mean, I don't really see the value in that. I, I don't want to believe. I want to know. Where are the transitional fossils? Um, there's tons of them. There's um, a crap ton of, of transitional horse fossils. There's transitional whale fossils that go back to like land mammals. There's Tiktaalik. There's um, Archaeopteryx. There's, and, and here's the thing. Those are the most famous ones. But if you actually like go and talk to a paleontologist, there are literally thousands, if not millions, every single fossil is technically a transitional fossil. And you can see how they, they are related to each other genetically, um, if they're more modern and we can, can analyze the, the genome. And when you go further back, then you can see um, 
in terms of uh, the uh, shape and, and size and stuff of the bones and, and whatnot, um, morphologically, how they are related. Evolution is just a theory. I mean, there's a lot of theories. Gravity, germ theory of disease, but we already talked about that. Um, Relating to the Big Bang Theory. A, oh, a, sorry. Theory, is, a theory is the highest standard that, that you can reach in science, period. It explains okay. why something works. It, it doesn't state... <laughs> Relating to the Big Bang Theory, where did the exploding star come from? I'm reading these out as a post. Where did the exploding star come from? I mean, there's there's a ton of stars. Um, basically, all you need, like I said earlier, is is gravity, matter, and time, and matter causes as gravity causes matter to coalesce into clumps of matter that then erupt as there's a lot of pressure. Uh, we have only one Lucy. When um, have we found? Why have we found more than one of everything else? I don't think there's only one because uh, Lucy is an Australopithecus afarensis, I believe, and I'm pretty sure we found quite a few. And, <laughs> okay. and and the thing is, there's there's like fossils are sparse. There's there's the the fossil record, you know, it's it takes a lot for a fossil, especially an older one, to be preserved. And yet, the fact that there are you know hundreds of millions of different animals, and some of them had larger and smaller populations, and we're not digging over the whole Earth, but like the longer that we dig and the more time that we look for this stuff, the more fossils we find. And last question: the Bible says that true Christians will be hated and persecuted by the world. Doesn't this content? Um, doesn't your content prove this point? I mean, I don't force anyone to watch my content. <laughs> I don't. I don't persecute anyone if they they want to turn off and unsubscribe and close the, the browser, they're absolutely welcome to. <laughs> okay. Well, you had some very thoughtful answers, but you did um, do it in four minutes and 40 seconds. So oh, no. You, you've lost to Sean and Q. But I think your answers were pretty... I'll pretty, get you uh, next thorough. time, Shannon. <laughs> oh, that was great. Um, it, it, there, there's some, there are some funny questions in there. and it, there's... You, could just, you could just like cut out and splice out all the pauses. And well, like... the, the, the problem is too, I was so drunk in the Shannon episode because it went for like three hours that like I was like, like stumbling the words. Like I was trying to read and I wasn't getting it done right. What was, um, her, what was her drink of choice? Um, she chose to drink a specific type of rum. Of course. Uh, and that I couldn't find, I couldn't find it anywhere in Australia. Um, mm. So I got this fancy ass rum here, and then turns out she couldn't even get her type, the type of rum that she thought she had. So she, <laughs> she couldn't get that either. So she ended up drinking this like bottom of the barrel rum that yeah. she just had in the pantry. And and I was like, this is perfect. I was like, because Shannon just drinks rum. I was like, this mm -hmm. is just you know. So it ended up being it's rum. I'm assuming. Uh, it's no, it's um. Well, this one was uh this. Mm. Uh, you can't okay. probably not going to load. Does she does she drink rum uh, just straight, or does she prefer like mixed? no? We we had Coke Zero with it, so okay, it's like a rum and yeah. Coke. So moving on to like your activism, um, so oh, you I can tell like already that you're like a strong advocate for scientific, um, you know, scientific skepticism, um, progressive values, um, things things like that. Um, can you explain, like, after you you kind of um, deconstructed your faith, how did you get involved in activism? Not intentionally. <laughs> <laughs> I, I started my channel initially because I, I had some experience with video editing. I'd been making movies since I was in, in high school. I'd, I'd messed around and made some videos on my phone, just kind of like weird magic trick, you know, by pausing and playing the camera. I'd made some stop motion Lego videos, which I still think are, are good, but they were pretty bad. But I'm, I'm proud of them as, as my earliest stop motion endeavors. And because of, of that, because my, my family was super religious and because I always felt like whenever I would try to talk about religion or have conversations about things that were remotely conversation or controversial, my family would tend to interrupt and cut me off. I have a suspicion that they may be as ADHD as I am, but uh, <laughs> so I, I thought, Hey, if I make these videos on YouTube, I can simply share the link with them and they can see the videos. And that way I don't have to have an argument they can simply watch them and be like, huh, okay, so that's his thought process. That's why he's not going to church anymore. That's why he's, you know, 
no longer believes in hell and demons and stuff. And so I, I made a couple videos, didn't share them with my family. I, I kind of chickened out a little bit because I still was sort of a brand new fresh atheist. And I had no idea what I was doing and how to talk about this stuff. And I was not as confident in my position or as, as um, well read on it. And over time, I I think I put out a video in 2015 and then I, I didn't make any content for like months at a time. And it wasn't this, hey, this is going to be a full-time thing. And then I, I made a couple other videos and I shared them to a couple of atheist groups and I saw that, you know, people were subscribing and, and following and I'm like, hey, this actually could grow into something. And I saw a lot of fundamentalism here in the South and right around this time, Trump was getting elected and I was very concerned with the direction that my country was going in and, and radical evangelicalism and Christian nationalism and the effect that it was having on the U.S. And I decided I was going to start talking about it more, you know, full time. But I, I, I started putting out videos that were a little bit more uh, comedic, but insulting. I, I put out a, a series called... <laughs> Um, animated Bible myths and basically yes. God, God's name was Dingleberry. Yeah, I saw that one. <laughs> it's it's not the type of content that necessarily will win people over. It wound up those were the videos that some of my family found and they were just insulted by it and yeah. upset. And so I, I kind of discontinued that series for a while and went more with you know, exploring topics and trying to explore ideas and not attack people or make fun. But I still, I throw in the occasional jab at people like John Hagee and other, you know, pastors who are, you know, particularly toxic. Yeah, the but, Greg Locke types. Yeah, as as my channel started taking off, I decided, hey, I, I think I want to do this full time. I think I can do this full time. There's, there's sort of a gap in the niche where, people had been making atheist content from about 2007 until about 2012. And then a lot of the atheist content creators on YouTube kind of shifted to talking more about social justice and social issues and politics and feminism and stuff. And there was a, there was a void where no one was talking about religious fundamentalism and atheism. And as a new atheist, I felt that void pretty hard and I desperately wanted to have a community and I figured that the best way to find a community would be to build one. Mm. And so I, I started making content. I started reaching out to other YouTubers and, and promoting them and collabing with them and uh, forming Facebook groups and bringing people together and eventually set up a conference and would fly people out and meet them in person and, and have them speak at the conference. And we'd bring dozens of people in. And um, over time, I kind of surrounded myself with other content creators and now some of my best friends actually live here in Austin and are other other YouTubers and stuff that kind of got started similarly to, to how I did and are also atheists and stuff. So it, it wasn't this intentional, deliberate thing initially. But then as I saw the direction that the country was going, I decided that I was going to cash in my savings, my retirements. And um, I actually flew overseas and I, I lived in Southeast Asia for a while just trying to make my funds stretch because you can get a really cheap apartment and cheap food. And there's a lot of co-working spaces with decent speed internet in um, Vietnam and Thailand. And so I, I lived there for about six months and kind of up oh, in like awesome. a, just like a small town um, up North Chiang Mai. And then I, I oh, lived on an I Island. Chiang Mai. I lived on an Island called Copenhagen. I, I went to Vietnam. I was in Hanoi and then Ho Chi Minh city. And I, I I didn't get to to do as much like touristy like vacationy type stuff because I was working basically nonstop. I was working like 12 hours a day because I was terrified that my channel wasn't going to take off in time to be able to be self-sufficient. Yeah. But I really poured my heart and soul into it and it really took off and then I came back to the states and started doing the conference circuit and speaking and stuff and then got invited to other places. I, I flew out to Australia a while back for a conference. I, I spoke at a conference in Israel. I've, you know, I'm speaking at this one in Indiana coming up. I've done ones in 
California, Texas, pretty much all over. And it just kind of became a thing that because I was passionate about talking about this stuff and because I, I you know, have experienced a lot of religious fundamentalism myself, I really wanted other people to not feel alone and to know that there, there are others who have gone through this stuff and who have been where they are and who have, mm. have come out of it and who've, who've come out of it and turned out okay that mm. things do get better even if you feel initially frustrated and angry like you've been lied to or you feel depressed and sad like how do i find my purpose that there is a brighter side on the other side and if you keep going and you keep pushing through you can deconstruct and you can heal and you can recover from the religious trauma and the baggage that it's exciting to explore and learn how the world works that you can find a community even if you have to move somewhere that there are other people out there and that you're not crazy and that it's okay to be curious it's okay to explore and to learn this stuff that in fact it's it's a good thing mm -hmm. and i think that by creating a community and bringing people together and setting up a conference and, and making videos that there's been a lot of people who I've been able to help. And that's kind of continued to fuel me. And the, the amount of encouragement and love and support that I've received, you know, sure. I've, I've gotten hate comments. Every, every YouTuber does. I've, I've gotten death threats and stuff, but like it's, it pales in comparison to the number of people who are supportive and who share my content and who support my work on, on like, patreon and stuff both financially as well as just like sending emails and saying like hey like you changed my life for the better and so it, it's it's hard to stop now because you it's it's a very um fulfilling thing it's it's a you know i i could have stayed i was working an it job and i was going and showing up and, and sitting in a cubicle all day and just staring at, at lines of code and, and database stuff. And I hated my job and I hated what I was doing. Cause I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I was doing something that. And it's not that those jobs are bad. It's not that those jobs aren't needed and that they aren't good. Like I was working for a university that like I, that I, I attended and that I loved, but and, you know, you can always do jobs like that and pay your bills and then also do something on the side that's, you know, a, a cause that you believe in. But being able to do the cause full time has been immensely rewarding. Mm. So, There's a long winded answer to a short question. That's a that's a like, I mean, yes, it was a long winded answer, but that was actually a beautiful answer because I, I felt I felt that whole that whole thing there, like a, a big thing for me, uh, when I was like, you know, deconstructing my faith is, is, is looking at, um, I think I, I shot off emails to various, you know, people, um, just saying like, you know, thank you. You've helped me feel comfortable about, about things. Cause it's a very, like I say this to people all the time that when I was questioning my faith, it was one of the most heartbreaking scary um traumatizing experiences of my life but also exciting it was this weird like dichotomy all of a sudden i could look at fossils and go oh wow they like i got one up here 65 million years old what the fuck i bought it at australia zoo for like 30 bucks it's a little <laughs> fish and i'm like what i'm like this is crazy this is real this, yeah. you know this isn't like scientists you know or the devil planting fossils to try and fool people this is real like i was like this is really people don't realize that there are literally millions and millions of fossils mm. and you know, you, you probably won't be able to, to easily get a hold of a affordable T-Rex skull intact, yeah, but because they're land animals. Well, cause they're, they're so, they're not just incredibly old, but they're also um, to be able to be preserved and intact as big as they are and, and all this stuff. Like it's, it's 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 harder to get a specific fossil too but if if you were to find something like a trilobite fossil there's literally just like a billions ridiculous <laughs> yeah ridiculous was... number like you just go and start digging and you'll you know stumble across something mm -hmm. but 
that might be a slight overstatement but like if you dig in the right places you'll absolutely yeah I've got a book on trilobites up there and I was like, oh, trilobites are cool. I've n- I haven't opened it yet, but I've, it's there ready for when I am feel the call. Um, I just want to, we've only got a, a little bit le- along, uh, left um, in the interview, but I do want to jump over some quick questions if that's okay. Um, so some of these are from um, uh, my Discord audience. Um, so one person asked, uh, do you recall a conversation with Jamie or, um, on Talk Heathen where you dealt with Darth Dawkins, who was called EF at the time? And if so, what did you learn about presuppositional apologetics? I've been on a lot of call-in shows. <laughs> that conversation comes up more <laughs> often than any other conversation. <laughs> and I think it's because Darth Dawkins has a reputation among the calling community of being the most insufferable, close-minded. <laughs> He's so insufferable. So fundamentalist so on a script where he starts <laughs> off on, Hey, I want to get from here to here. I have made up my mind. That yeah. this is a Good argument. I am not willing to listen to a single thing that someone says, yeah. and I'm going to stay on script. Even if you don't bite and you have yeah. something that completely destroys my initial, <laughs> my initial premise. I am just going to railroad through and keep going and not yeah. listen. And that call, I think most calls on, on talk even usually around like maybe 20 minutes maximum. Yeah. That call was like over an hour. I, mean, I could be wrong. I, I, no, that. it is. I'm only like 20 but, minutes into it. And uh, it was I'm... painful. And we, we went so far over time with that show. And I'm surprised that Jamie didn't just like, cut it off and say hey we have to go to the caller <laughs> but um it, i mean it was, it was good viewing i guess like people were common it's funny and people were pissed off and saying i i'm never gonna watch again if he calls in but at the same time like they're they're all talking Numbers about it and sharing it and getting you know upset and stuff but presuppositional apologetics is frustrating because it it the, the conclusion is presupposed before they even begin <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And, and it's like if you put in, it's like they're a computer program. And unless you put in the correct string, it's mm-hmm. just, it just like, nope, can't, can't get past that section. Does not and compute. Yeah, it does not compute. Yeah. <laughs> I think there was a part in that conversation where I was just like, because he, he, he goes by a bunch of pseudonyms. I think his pseudonym at the time was like EF or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, EF, hear me out. And he just like rattled off and I was like, EF, sugar muffin. Like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> and I have to, I'll link this in the description. People need to check it he, out. He, it, I think it caught him off guard that I called him sugar muffin. Sugar muffin. <laughs> but then he, he didn't quite know how to, to come back. And so he started like calling me baby cakes and like a bunch of other stuff. And Really? Just, like, he he i need to watch this fully he did like to an excessive amount to a socially awkward amount like he just like kept on reusing the same <laughs> that, like i had and it just kind of felt flat but um he's, I, so I'm definitely... he's he's something else yeah he's like a walking meme at this stage i would i'm gonna have to watch the rest of that because i only got 20 minutes in like i said and i'll link it in the description for people to check out um <laughs> what advice would you give to yourself when you first started doubting if you could whisper in yourself's ear oh that is a good question that i have never been asked on a show before and i'm amazed that i haven't been that is a really good question i think i would say that it's okay it's okay to explore it's not the end of the world there is a big bright beautiful universe out there at your fingertips And that because truth withstands scrutiny, dive in, dive in and drink deeply of the, the, the knowledge that's at your fingertips. That's, that's a great, that's a great response. Um, so I asked this, I had Michael Jones on on the deep drinks, uh, a while ago. Um, and he gave some that episode. Yeah, yeah, he was. It was. It was good. Um, he, so he. he I, I, I asked him, like. I like Michael. He's. He is. We, we disagree on a lot of stuff, but I've. I've yeah. Hung out with him in person. I, I think he's a good guy. 
I I will always if someone is a Christian um like that I that I know and they're they're not um they're not unconvinced of the existence of God like I am, um and they're like I'm struggling with this I'll always point them to Michael Jones's channel because I think he is I've always said this he's the most honest an apologist can be I think. I think from what I've what I've discovered, his his content, like he he accepts evolution. He's also a great guy. He's funny. He's yeah. um I, he's, I feel bad because I, I did I did a I did a synopsis slash review of the debate that we had where because we, we had a debate in person on is Christianity dangerous? And then my one of my my editor, Eric Murphy of the the skeptic generation uh youtube channel it formerly he was he was a show host of talk heathen we sat down and we watched through the debate or parts of the debate and basically i got eric's feedback and and i responded on stuff and i feel bad because i i don't think that i gave michael jones enough credit um because i i don't think that michael jones is a dishonest person i don't think that he is trying to deceive people and i don't think that he is acting in bad faith and and he's intelligent and he's smart and he mm. looks at this stuff there were things in the debate where i think it was a little bit um a little bit how do i say this like tactfully like there were elements where he would say things like some of the benefits of religion are like increased attendance of like, I, I, I don't want to misquote it, but it, it was almost mm. like one of the benefits of religion is that people become more religious. Like it's, it seemed kind of circular and I didn't catch that until afterwards. I didn't bring that up in the debate, but there, there were elements of it that felt a little bit like eh, kind of off mm. to me. And then there were a few things that he said that Eric pointed out that I hadn't caught that were, that that seemed a little bit uh sly but i don't necessarily think it was intentional in retrospect mm -hmm. and i he's someone who i would not hesitate to talk with and engage with and work with in the future and i want to see better bridges built and i think he's someone who is is willing to call out bad actors within his own circle and his own community and is he just did a he just did a one and a half hour live stream with kent hoven's two ex-wives mm. and called out kent hoven yeah i was for... watching that earlier today mm. yeah yeah I, I i i you know i said thank you for this um because i think it's important to call out domestic abuse and things like that and and ken Hoven responded to it in the comments <laughs> i know i love it so much oh he's such a well, he's a meme he's more of a meme than any um well the bible sales um than uh anyone um yeah. so I, I i disagree with michael on a lot so but do I. I don't think he's a bad guy and i like he he seems like he's he's very curious and he's inquisitive he's not a young earth creationist i don't think he's a you know radical fundamentalist or anything and and i i i feel like in my response video i may have burned a bridge by like i, th I think my response video made it sound as though i was assuming his intent in a negative way and, and to some extent i think i may have done that and i like michael if you're seeing this then like that that wasn't my goal um, but I, I should have been more, um, I definitely charitable. should have been more charitable. Yeah. The, the thing with Michael is, um, like, uh, I disagree on, on many of his, um, conclusions. Um, he's more educated than I am. Um, but not, not that I think that matters for a lot of the things that we're discussing. However, if there was, you know, he's probably in the top five people that I, that I've spoken to in real life that I would love to have another beer with because he's mm -hmm. just we could just go on for days like he's um we just he 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 doesn't he, he's he doesn't seem i can engage with him in a way that i i never feel like he's trying to be dishonest or like mm -hmm. you know um anyway the two the two questions i asked him just to because we're running out of time here is um what do you think is the best argument for the existence of god and on the contrary what do you think the, mm -hmm. is the best argument against the existence of god which god 
oh you just that's kind of uh let's go with um well I mean, are you answering that or are you genuinely asking? No, 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 I'm, I'm genuinely asking because like uh, th it's it's and, and the reason that I'm, I'm saying I'm not saying it as like an atheist gotcha like, oh, well, which one? Because the, the, the reason that I want to make that distinction is because I feel like all too often when religious people ask, why don't you believe in God? What they're asking is, why don't you believe in the Christian God? Because it's the one that most of the English speaking world thinks of when you say God. Mm. And I think that's a really, really, really huge difference from any God. So well, what if we broadened it to the existence of a creator? Okay. So like the God of classical theism. Yeah. I, I think that this is going to sound like a somewhat of a cliche answer, but I do feel like the fine tuning argument is one of the better arguments for God that um, now that, that, creator could be a simulation designer it could be a an alien that's creating a bunch of different universes as like a fuel source and it's just like fine-tuning and you know calibrating their instruments and they have and we're super super tiny and they're super huge i have no idea it, it could be any number of like an unlimited possible you know variety of different gods I don't necessarily find that option as very convincing. And the reason that I don't is because it's, it ultimately comes down to an infinite regress of what is the origin of, of that God. And if we know that by, by studying um, biochemistry and by studying astrophysics and astronomy and looking at where stars and the universe and, and and everything came from we're getting a pretty good picture of the puzzle there's still a lot of missing pieces but you don't have to have every piece to have a pretty good idea of what the, the puzzle is a picture of and what we're finding is that a lot of this stuff just happens naturally and we can create a lot of these steps in the lab or observe them either in, in outer space or, you know, happening on their own in laboratories. We see a lot of the early building blocks of life just forming on their own naturally and then coming together and coalescing into larger, more complicated objects. Um, I believe Jack Shostak has done a bunch of work on this at, at Harvard University. Um, there's, there's others. I, I have a whole series called The Story of Life. Right now, I just have three episodes in it, but it talks about um, links, links in the abiogenesis. And the more that I, I look at that, the, it, it just makes sense that this stuff came about naturally. Now, were the original laws of the universe pre-programmed? Potentially. Are there multiple universes out there? Well, it kind of is a, like, if, if you believe that string theory is real, then that is kind of a, um, the, the, the math implies that there would be more than one, one universe. And so it's it's not just that people are postulating this to try to get out of the God hypothesis. It's that the, the theories that we have to try to best explain the way that the universe works do indicate that there could be more than one universe. And if there's an infinite number of them, then eventually in one of them, we're going to see that the laws of physics that would allow for life. And so, and we would only exist in that universe because we couldn't in the others. So the, the question for God is, is if we know that we could come about naturally, maybe there is a God that created us. Maybe we aren't the first step, but you keep tracing it back and something like it's got to come from somewhere, especially if time is, if there is some form of time, even if it's not our time, even if it's out, if this God is outside of our space time, if it's in its own form of space time, because it has cause and effect, then somehow this God has to have some origin. The notion that it is completely eternal and yet is outside, like is, is not affected by cause and effect and is, is able to take actions, but is outside time. Like it doesn't make sense. The question is, where does this God originate from? How did it, like, how did it get there? 
And mm. to me, it, it seems like if, if you go far enough back in time to the, the very beginning of the universe, you have an incredibly, incredibly simple starting state where, you know, you, you have the most, the, the, the lightest possible elements in the universe and nothing else. And then they slowly form into the, these heavier elements and, and stars and you have nuclear fusion and then you have, you know, uh, biochemistry forming us through abiogenesis. And we can see a bunch of these steps and we know quite a bit of information. So my question is like, if, if we know that you can get from this really, really simple stuff to us, naturally why do you need to posit something else and if you mm. do have something else where did it come from like or, or was it the first thing that came from nothing maybe it exists but i i don't see any evidence of it interacting or, or upturning the laws of nature every miracle that i've seen proposed has natural explanations as well or they're they're unfalsifiable unprovable anecdotes at least the, the things that I've seen in my life that have been attributed to the miraculous have had far better natural explanations. So that's, that's kind of my reason for pumping the brakes when it comes to the God argument and for holding on to a, a little bit of doubt in that regard. That's, that, that's, that's really, that's a really thorough answer. Um, just because we're right at time here, I'll, I'm going to skip a couple of questions and jump straight to the last question and a bonus question. Mm. Bonus question is just a bit fun. Last question. What, if anything, would change your mind? That's that's a question that I have... I've thought about extensively and I've had various answers at various times I think if <clears throat> when it comes down to the Christian God, there's not very much that would change my mind at this point because I've studied too much about the ancient Israelite culture and the Canaanites and the, the origins of the religion to where it's so obviously man-made. It has so many external influences. It has so much, like th there's, there's so many elements of it that are and, and like, it's, it's obviously man-made in addition to the internal contradictions, in addition to the, the mistranslations through history, the, the, the lack of divine preservation, the just poor hodgepodge way that it was put together, the scientific inaccuracies, the, the horrible way that it's been communicated that is anything but divine <clears throat> and and historical inaccuracies and failed prophecies there's there's so many things in it that like i don't think that there's anything at this point that can change my mind about the christian god and most other religions in terms of another god some other kind of you know if we're living in a simulation or something like i i don't know i'm, I'm an agnostic on on that front i, I feel like if God were all knowing and it was an omnipotent, omniscient, you know, God that sees everything and is everywhere at once, it would know what it would take to change my mind. And if it was omnibenevolent or all loving that, then it would do what it takes to make sure that it saves me unless hell is imaginary, which I think hell is also man-made. So yeah. maybe it doesn't care. Maybe it doesn't matter to the deity, mm -hmm. if I believe or not. And the fact that I am being a sincere, genuine skeptic pursuing the truth wherever it leads, maybe that's the test and I'm passing. Um, and that a failure of the test would be blind credulity. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think I'm open to having my mind changed. I'm, I'm open to going where the evidence leads. I don't know exactly what it would take because I know that our minds can deceive us. We can ha have hallucinations. We can have false memories. We can you know, think we see something that we didn't. Um, but I, I think if there was a way to, to measure it and test it and, you know, see maybe through like a, a prayer study where only when you pray to one specific God, you see people like regrow limbs and stuff that otherwise doesn't happen naturally. 
and it consistently happens. And then maybe like a deity steps in and, and takes credit for it. And, you know, it's defies the laws of, of physics and, and everything that we know about the universe. I would definitely be open to, to reconsidering, but I, I don't see anything like that. So as of yet, I'm, I remain an atheist towards almost every single God I've ever heard of. Um, but agnostic towards the notion of a potential creator. Mm. And just on a side note, um, I'm also an atheist to every single God that I've heard of. And I, um, spent four and a half hours on this channel, reading out the name of every single God in existence. Um, and holy crap, should I have brought a glass of water because I had this one little tiny glass and I was sipping it. And by the end, my throat was screwed for days. Four and and half hours took me. Those, those are just the ones that you know of. That they're just the ones that were on the godchecker.com website and mm. you know, they have all their peer-reviewed sources, but I'm sure there are millions of gods that are I, I believe lost that, to time. I, I believe that there's there's a common trope that I, I think Hitchens put forth that it's like there's 30,000 gods or some specific number. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a gross misunder un, like underestimate of the number yeah. of gods like they're, they're well, it's in millions just think yeah. about like the the dawn of recorded history what like six thousand years ago or something like roughly like mesopotamia like th humans have been around for a little bit longer than that so it's like you know well, the, the yeah. various indigenous gods of different parts of of africa of haiti of of you know the various hindu gods the south american gods like not to like a lot of them haven't even been recorded we don't yeah. even know the names of them. You know, Australia and has even the Canaanite deities, you know, we'll see these these pillar figurines that we assume are Asherah, but we don't know. Like maybe <laughs> it's something else. Australia has the oldest living uh culture in the world, which is the Australian Aboriginals. And um they've got like I was amazed to read out and mispronounce <laughs> hundreds of their gods um by the end of the four hours, by the way, I was saying um I was saying the word saint, but I was saying slash because my mm. brain was so fried. Anyway, last question. This is a bonus question, and then you can go. Um, favorite afterlife. So I'm going to... What would be your favorite afterlife? And as soon as you say, I like this afterlife, it becomes true, what afterlife would you choose? So that includes reincarnation. That includes the typical heaven. That includes Rick and Morty when he takes off the mm -hmm. goggles and he's in an alien uh, arcade. Whatever you want. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> literally <laughs> so in terms of like philosophically interesting i was going to answer that way but then you said as soon as i say it it comes true for me yeah now i'm, I'm like a deer in headlights because i want to have like the, the perfect afterlife but um <laughs> I'll, I'll stick with my uh, initial original yeah go initial. It's, it's, it's fascinating and that's if you've ever read the short story the egg by andy weir it's um I believe it's it's the same author who wrote the the Martian. If you've seen the, the movie, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and the 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 basic idea is that reincarnation is real, but you are every single person who has ever lived. So you are okay. both Jesus and the people who crucified him. You're both okay. Hitler and the Jews who he killed. You are you are literally everyone. And so every okay. horrible atrocity that you've inflicted, you've inflicted on yourself. But every time, okay. every time that you're reborn, your memory is wiped. And so over the course of this process, you are basically like an embryo. You're an egg. You are a divine deity that is experiencing all of this stuff, all the horrible things and all of the wonderful things. And you are learning and growing through this process and realizing by doing these things to yourself you are learning what it's like to experience this stuff. And so then by the wow. time you're born, you have the maturity of a God and you are now a part of these deities. Wow. That's like a, a plot of Doctor Who. That is incredible. That's incredible. I'm going to have to read that book, that, that short mm. story. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah it's very... not very long. Like you can, you can probably sit down and read it in a sitting. Yeah. But Oh, awesome. Well, um, Thomas, I know you have another show to get to. Uh, thank you so much for coming on Deep Drinks Podcast. I'm very drunk. Uh, I almost <laughs> finished the entire thing. Um, thank you so much. Um, you're you're lucky, pleasure. though, because like, I was doing this on an empty stomach. 
Yeah. <laughs> I've had two pieces of white to- white bread toast this morning. It's like nothing. Like I'm <laughs> I'm 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 surprised at how composed I am, but really well, like what, you're drinking in the morning too, because we started the show at I think yeah. eleven o'clock your time. I, I literally had my morning coffee half an hour before I started drinking this. Like it was yeah, it's wild. Um, but I thank you for taking the time to come on. It was it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I'll leave all your links to your um in the description. Oh, God, I'm already chasing my words. I'll leave all your links in the description, um, of course. Um, I'll leave your you want descriptions me. in the link. <laughs> so I'll put all your stuff in the description. I, I recommend everyone check out um, uh, uh, Holy Kool-Aid's channel. I'll leave some playlists that you've mentioned as well as some other videos that you've mentioned as well um, and the conversation that you had with EV slash Darth Dawkins, uh, EF slash Darth Dawkins. Oh, geez, oh, it really has affected me. But thank you so much for coming on, Thomas. Um, it's been a fantastic um, conversation. And remember, everyone, don't drink the Kool-Aid unless it's this because this is delicious. Thank you, David. <laughs>